Hi, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to this week's Knowledge Exchange event with Pro Manchester and Grayling PR, very proudly sponsored by us at Virgin Money. For those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Ruby and I am the events coordinator over at our Virgin Money store on Market Street in Manchester. And like many of you, we're all working from home at the moment, but it's great to still be able to connect with you all through these events each week. So our main priority at the moment is supporting our customers. So and all the support that we offer can be found on our website and we'll make sure that that's circulated to all of you after the event. And we really hope you enjoy today's talk and shout about it all over social media. Do tag us in your social posts. That's at Virgin Money on all social platforms. And today's topic, we're talking to the hospitality industry. So I'll hand over to Chris Peacock from Grading PR to get started. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ruby. And hello, everyone, again. Um, it's an incredibly poignant day today, obviously, for everyone in Manchester. Um, and it's I'm, I'm so pleased that we've been able to mark it um, with our two minute silence before starting today. Um, I think the hospitality sector particularly um, has been one area that has particularly suffered um, with COVID-19. I think today's talk that we've got for you is going to be a particularly interesting one. So I just realised I said particularly about 16 times then, so I'll try and stop using that word. Um, so to let's get moving on and let's have our conversation around hospitality sector in Manchester. I'm really pleased um, with the line that we've got for you today. So I'm just quickly going to run through who's joining me on the on the chat. And um, we've got Sean Hines, who's the CEO of Manchester Central. Um, we've got uh, Becky Ingham, who's an associate um, at Co Kites Solicitors, who deals in licensing. Um, very kindly, we're being joined by Tom Asbro, um, who's a sales manager at the Lowry Hotel. And we were hoping for Greg McGuire to join us from the Hook Group, but sadly, Greg's ha um, not been able to join us today. And if the stars align and the technology works, I'm really hoping that we're going to be joined by Liz Taylor as well um, from Taylor Lynn Corporations Limited, um, who do events. Um, we're still working on that at the moment with Liz, but hopefully she'll join us in a little while. So let's get going. Um, hi, everyone. To start off with, I wanted to ask about what the current measures that have been put in place to support the hospitality sector in Manchester, both at a national and local level. Um, what are you experiencing at the moment? How are things going? Uh, and Sean, I thought if we could start with you, if you could set the scene for us a little bit from, from your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and hi to everybody um, who's tuned in. I, um, look, I, I represent an element of the hospitality industry, obviously running Manchester Central and the events we have, but I'll, I'll talk perhaps broadly in terms of the sector. You, you know, you, I think you really understate, uh, actually, in your intro there, Chris, the, the impact to, to the industry. I mean, devastation, catastrophic. I mean, these, these words are too small to describe what has happened. When you're 99% down, um, when you've got absolutely nothing in your order book, when basically you've got no kind of sense or outlook of how your business is going to return, and yet you've got your your rent to look after, you've got your staff to consider, you've got the you, you've got a business to contend with, you've got supply chain, you, you've got all of these things going on around you. I mean, it really has been just the most extraordinary experience. Now, for me, we we it's it's I've had the extra layer of my business and my venue effectively being requisitioned by um, the NHS to form the Nightingale Hospital, of course, which which um, is a whole other story. But, um, you know, so the the challenge I think we, we, we started out with was the, the the confusion that arose right at the very beginning of this process where there was uncertainty around what you could do, what you couldn't do what businesses were involved uh, what what was included and what was excluded and, and i remember when i was looking at it we, we had many discussions about whether we felt the advice coming from government was was including events or excluding events and when i think about a, a conference venue does that mean that a a conference and incentive venue was included in the measures or it wasn't included in the measures and so to answer your point initially I think we got off to a really stunted start because there was there was there was a lot of work that went into trying to understand whether or not the measures that were being talked about actually applied to our industry as as time went on each day 
um, it became a little bit clearer and the government produced a little bit more advice, which was helpful. And I think, you know, bars, restaurants, hotels, it started to become a little bit clearer as to what would happen. And eventually, of course, when lockdown occurred, we all knew what the situation was. And I remember that there was a last week when when people were thinking about, well, you know, um, technically the bars are still open. Everything else is closed. We're going into lockdown. Should we go to the pub? And I think I, I remember thinking that like on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. And by the time we got to Saturday, it was impossible because it, it, everything had been taken outside of our hands. So so I think we struggled initially to get the definitions uh, to be helpful. I think there's been a uh, almost a, 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 an irresponsible lack of understanding of the role that the wider hospitality industry plays in our economy, um, whether that's the role it plays in society, the role it plays in terms of em employment opportunities, the, the 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 economic positives that all of these businesses bring to that local community, um, I just I just think we you know people talk about tourism and hospitality and they say oh you know it's a great industry and it's big but when it comes to government we just even though we measure our impact in billions and the job numbers in hundreds of thousands and we measure tourism as the fourth largest industry in the UK and and all of these top of the league um, descriptions yeah actually when push comes to shove we get we get left behind so coming up to where we are now it, you know I'm pleased with, with what we've got I think we've got a support package which as we all know and everybody watching knows is, is has never been seen before and and good lord who knows what would have happened if we didn't have these measures in place all right I think they've they've been a life saver for many businesses that otherwise just simply wouldn't wouldn't be here today and that's just eight weeks down the line um the question i think that we're all facing now is how do we come out of this how do we bridge the gap between when the measures stop and technically business restarts yet i think in our industry we're not going to get straight back to normal you know we're going to see a very slow climb back up to normal levels of business and of course in any in any business you have a break even point as to what you know where you've got to get over before your business is viable and unfortunately there's going to be a period of time where you've got this this pro this period of of non viability coupled potentially with additional costs to meet the measures that are being imposed so what i'm looking for and some of the bodies that i sit on representing our industries i'm looking for certainty beyond what the current support scheme says and, and how we can we can have a parachute of support, if you like, while society opens back up, business starts to reopen, but we can we can downstream the support measures while we kind of upstream business activity, if that makes sense. No, ab absolutely, Sean, and thank you for that. I think that's really helpful um, to set the scene like that. And, and actually, I, following that, I just wanted to, to go to, if I go to Becky first, if that's OK, um, with your clients. Do you think that's, in terms of the support packages at the very start of this, when we were in a situation where the government were suggesting that we don't go to restaurants and pubs and encouraging us not to do this, this and this, do you, was that a similar situation with a lot of your clients, particularly the licensing industry, like the, the I think the, the way that Sean described that misinformation or lack of information to clarity of what it was and wasn't possible? Was that something you witnessed as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think there was a lot of confusion initially and there's a lot of concern, like Sean says, about what is going to happen coming out of it. Um, and, and Sean's sort of talking about, you know, a tapering back up of business. And I think that that, that needs to coincide with sort of a tapering down of the measures that have been put in place. Um, there was a there was a serious concern, I think, with a lot of our clients that the, the furlough scheme would just stop and there'd be a cliff edge there. Um, so I think the extension of that has has brought a lot of comfort to a lot of our clients. Um, but yeah, it, it's like Sean was explaining, you know, that there, there will come a point where, and at the moment, you know, the date is the 4th of July when in theory doors can reopen. Um, but when we start talking about how that reopening might happen, um, what 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 that might look like, what a restaurant or a bar or a, or a nightclub or whatever might look like um, there's going to be various businesses thinking well actually my business just doesn't work like that or it isn't going to make the money that it was making previously and what we don't want is for businesses to be reopening struggling with you know much much reduced profits compared to sort of pre-lockdown levels but with that support whipped away um, so I think we need to make sure that the industry is sort of 
singled out for support um, is facilitated in reopening um, and, and yes, yeah, supported in doing that. I think the furlough scheme has been a great thing. Um, there's a lot of talk with uh, UK Hospitality, Hospitality Action and, and Jonathan Downey is pushing out the national time out um, sort of campaign. Um, and I think that's going to be the next thing that's going to be really important for operators. Um, you know, the furlough scheme dealt with one of the, the one of the industry's major costs um, but rent is the next one that's looming and, and rent quarter is is very soon so I think everyone will be interested to see where that goes as well. That's great and Tom from a, a hotelier perspective um, I mean obviously no one coming into the city to, to stay overnight I mean I myself I regularly stay in a few, well, I always like to stay in one of the, the hotels in the city when I've got a big special occasion to celebrate wife's birthdays, um, family dues and so on. Um, how has, have you seen the hotel sector with the current situation and how are you finding things at the moment? Uh, well, just, I'm on a bill at the minute, but obviously I'm still, um, I mean, the point that I was going to, Say going back to where I buy not to go to Puddle not to hold, uh, Puddle and Rest Post not to hold, um, specifically to not go. Uh, I've sort of so used the word the same before the industry that, that Sean hit on. So I don't feel that the support was there initially. Now, in terms of hotel reopening, we've got created to buy rental bins, but Sean hit it on the head before. I mean, you're going to open these hotels and some of them are going to be given up better to help going to be losing money. So, um, whilst, yes, it's great if we can reopen, is it going to be worth reopening for a lot of these places? Um, probably not for the next couple of months until we, we come out the other side of this, whatever that may be, and we can reopen at decent enough occupancies, and we still don't know what the, the occupancies will be limited to um, moving forward. So, um, for the hotel industry, a lot is still up in the air to a lot of people around different hotels, and there's not that much information out there. Well, there is some information out there, but there's no clear guidelines in place. I know the guys at the Lowry are working uh, tirelessly with the opening plan, but we don't know what the business is going to be looking like, especially in terms of events. You're going to be reducing capacities. It, it's all up in the air at the minute. Um, we'll touch on the furlough scheme as well. Though. I mean, that that is is a great a great team that has supported a lot of my friends and colleagues through. Um, so in terms of support for that, you can count on the furlough scheme. But there are other aspects, as Sean hit on, in terms of the whole overall industry kind of being left to the wayside. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. Thanks, Tom. I think one of the things that we've seen through doing these webinars around different sectors and the conversations that have been taking place, there is a there's a great attitude in Manchester yeah. to help everyone come through this and to try and get through to the other side and as we've acknowledged that there are going there are difficult times ahead and very difficult decisions need to be made and, uh, and certainly but how have we seen the the sector adapt in these circumstances um i mean becky what what have your clients been doing in in, in this time in terms of trying to at least trying to be doing something rather than having to just sit and wait sadly what's going to come next yeah, I mean, the, during this period, um, it, the sector is fantastically innovative and that's one of the reasons I think that we all love working in it. Um, so I've seen lots of clients sort of doing their best to, to keep going and um, and keep doing various things throughout. Um, we've had, you know, a number of inquiries from clients who are looking at, can I offer, can I offer takeaway, can I offer delivery? Um, can I do that sort of thing? I don't know whether necessarily for most that is sort of um, keeping them going as they were before. It may be a case of sort of losing less money rather than making money on it. But, but you know, there's still there's still a lot of ideas out there, um, a lot of um, a lot of schemes to, to sort of um, get product into the clients' homes. Uh, into customers' homes, you know, um, with things like cook at home and delivering kits to to make the sort of meals that that um, customers might be missing from restaurants and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we've had a lot of inquiries about sort of different innovative ways that people can keep trading during this time. Um, and then I think the next stage will be what they do and and how they get prepared for for reopening sort of more permanently going forward. Yeah, that's great, Becky. I think we, I, I'd like us to come on to what we think. Um, 
companies, businesses should be looking at for, for opening when we come towards the end of lockdown. Um, I want to come on to that later. But Sean, I think you, you've, you've already touched upon, you've probably got one of the biggest examples of um, having to diversify what your offer has been. Um, like you said, you have been acquisitioned or taken over by the NHS. Um, how how did that come about? Was that a, a did you receive a phone call asking what what, what have you got on over the next couple of months, yeah. or did you um, offer the offer the facilities yourselves? How, how did that come about? Let me uh, well let me there's a there's a long story there, and uh, you know I'm, I, I joke now a lot of my friends that you know I've got so immersed into the the healthcare um, scene that you know if you need any minor procedures doing knees you know backs anything like that you know I'm I'm not quite I'm not quite at neurosurgery yet but I'm you know I'm, I'm not too bad if it's just a quick uh, a quick uh, orthopedic operation I could probably help you out but um let me let me just pick up uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention before I come on to that really which was um talking about how some examples of how c companies have adapted and I, I'll give a quick plug to um the the guys down at Manchester Gin who's who are actually up, they're my tenant um, on Watson Street they occupy space inside my facility and um, you know what what they they had a they had a business which obviously was 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 supplying bars and restaurants as well as as well as their own bar and restaurant um, their production line actually changed to produce uh, hand sanitizer for the hospital which uh, was was you know was, that that came about as a comp through a conversation that we had. And I think what, what um, Seb and Jen have done, which I think really talks about this notion of how you keep engagement going on, which is, you know, they, they've they been doing things online. They've got something coming up this, not this Saturday, next Saturday, which is they're trying to get the world's largest uh, online gin tasting. And they're selling products to people to buy like a gin tasting box. You get it at home and then you actually participate in this great event. And I think the reality of it is it's brilliant engagement, right? Great social keeps keeps the brand front of mind. But is it is it going to sell enough bottles of gin to keep that business in the same position that they were in before? Absolutely not. And I, you know, I see another one of our neighbours, Simon Wood. You know, he's doing some great stuff with his his menus online as well. Um, and 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 that will come back and pay dividends for him. But you can't. He won't be able to sustain his business empire on the back of of that but it gives it is examples of how we are adapting and how we're um how, how we're changing and in the events industry of course the obvious the obvious one is virtual events which you know many people are well by virtue of the fact that many people are, are hopefully tuning in and watching us now it gives you a sense of that this is a very real part of of what lockdown existence is like what what it's shown to me is that virtual events are nothing like the real thing um and as, as entertaining and as engaging as we can try and be you know even things like one of our panelists today liz can't get on for example so you know it's just not it's just not the same and you know i, I can't wait to when we get back um, to doing real life events, but I do think that technology and digital will be will be complementary and will be a part of that. You know, look, the, the story of the hospital is an interesting one. We we closed we closed the venue down. We were we were basically prepared for COVID. The the venue had been locked down. Most people were working from home. We hadn't quite got into the full furlough thing at that point. Um, but then I got a call where basically the NHS were on the phone saying to me, look, we've got we've got some people from the uh, army want to come around and just take a look at your site because they're assessing potential field hospitals. That was on a, a Wednesday afternoon by, uh, by sorry, Thursday morning. By Thursday afternoon, we had about eight or nine military on site. And over the course of that weekend, we stood up the project team to build a hospital, which uh, 13 days, 14 days later, we handed over to the NHS on the 12th of April. So um, it was an extraordinary uh, turnaround and, and we could spend hours talking about the the, the, the stuff that went into that and, and the, the infrastructure that's been put in. But what I will say is this, as a venue, we are very used to seeing transformations, right? We Every, every different event we have in place, we build something different. We host a different industry. We we talk about a different sector. We're doing educational stuff, academic stuff, um, um, entertainment, all, all of the, the, the full cross section of events. But we've never seen anything like what took place over that 13 or 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's just been I mentioned this earlier on another call. You know, it's been incredibly proud to be a part of it. And it's it's quite fitting that an institution such as Manchester Central, which is such an iconic 
aspect of Manchester. You know, everybody knows the arch, everybody knows the building. Many people have got fond memories of, of its original um, uh, 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 use as a railway station, as well as its more recent use as a concert venue. Um, and of course, in the last 14, 15 years, we've been running world-class business events as well. And now another chapter in this story is, is the Nightingale Hospital. Um, and you know, we, we, we're maintaining a dialogue with the NHS about how long this will continue. Um, we expect to get the venue back Actually, actually sooner rather than later at the moment, the way that the, the agreement is written, I would expect to have the venue back. Um, the, the, the challenge, I think, is whether or not the measures and the confidence and the sentiment is keeping pace with the timetable that we originally wrote back in March. And I, I, I don't expect us to be running the sorts of events that we would be running back in September and October that we were originally. I, I sense it's going to take us some time to get there if indeed we are we are back as an event venue and not continuing our role as as a, a critical health facility in, in Greater Manchester. Yeah. So um, so lots of lots of open questions, lots of dialogue mm -hmm. going on. You know, we could we could devote the rest of this session, but we won't to that whole that whole <laughs> yeah. process because it is absolutely it is fascinating and it's it's something you will look back on it and it, it's something very special to have been part to, yeah. to have been a part of. There's definitely a book in that for you, Sean, somewhere. Well, I'm looking for a speaking speak tour, mate. I'm telling you, I'm going, I'm going on tour. You know, if, <laughs> when events when events uh, start again, you know, I'll be like, going to do. I'll be like Elton John in Vegas. <laughs> well, actually, that's a great segue. If that's okay, I'll, I'll, I know we're having some sound issues with Tom, but hopefully we've got those sorted. Um, and actually, there's a great segue. Actually, I want to talk about in terms of next, and and Becky actually mentioned it too, about thinking about what does the hospitality sector need to be thinking about now for preparing to come out of it um, and i was wondering tom uh, have you got a perspective from that from the hotel side of things um what are what is the hotel sector looking at in terms of thinking right once it's over what can we do what kind of um practices can we instill to try and help facilitate reopening and and getting guests back into the city can you hear me my phone better it's still a bit, a bit broken, but we can hear you just about, I think. OK, I'll do my best to move as close as possible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we don't know what it's going to look like reopening from a hotel point of view, wise, what the occupancy is going to look like. We're probably going to be mandated to reduce occupancy. Um, uh, what that looks like in terms of rooms, um, we don't know yet. And I say we don't know, I mean, obviously. Tom, it's clearer when, when you're looking that direction, the way you just were, uh, which is your right it's much yeah better. right there speak yeah. that way <laughs> okay oh. yeah. it, it helps Tom. that's actually your best side as well so <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah we don't know what occupancies are going to look like um uh, we're, we, we feel i mean speaking to other people in the industry that we're obviously going to have to run at lower occupancies um which going back to the original point will affect profitability and break even points from an events point of view, again, you, if we, we have to abide by social distancing rules for events, it's going to reduce the capacities and our margins as well. So there's ways which the industry will have to look at how we can do that and still make the money that, that we need to survive, really. Um, I know that the team at the Lowry have been looking at, at, at capacities uh, across the ballroom um for what we can look at in terms of social distancing um but yeah i, I, I think we we don't really know uh yet what it's going to look like yeah that's interesting Tom. and actually that that's really helpful again segue because we, we've we've had a question through um again anyone listening please feel free to um ask any questions or any comments and we'll do our best to answer them as we go on um we've had a question from anonymous um asking about social distancing actually so this and i'm going to pass this over to you becky to answer actually because I, I think it is directed towards you um social distancing is being forced for, throughout the uk however i feel the government think opening up on the 4th of July will be OK, but we cannot operate social distancing in a social venue. How can the smaller bars operate? Uh, Rebecca, if they are struggling and feel there is no future for their bar, what would you suggest they do? So what are you what are your thoughts at the moment around that planning of what comes next and what are your clients saying to you about it? 
Sorry, um, you, you broke up ever so slightly at the start, but I think I think I got the gist of the question there. So, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're advising sort of a wide variety of, of clients on, on what reopening might look like. Um, we run sort of a weekly, um, so we call it a lunch time, a lunch date um, with various different leisure operators from bars to restaurants to um, to pubs to clubs. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's difficult because we are in a position at the moment where the, the government haven't yet published the COVID secure guidelines on what social distancing might actually look like in premises within our industry. Um, but I think there's, there's various things to think about from, from the small to the big. Um, and I think the key thing is to, it, it, it's got to be heavily caveated by saying that for some people, and I think this is what, what Sean was saying at the start as well, for some people um, it, this might not be possible and it might be a case for certain types of venues that they're going to be looking at opening later um, and more long term. But I think for businesses that are looking to open as soon as they can, um, we know that social distancing is going to be a part of it. And I think it's a case of sort of envisaging how your style of operation might need to adapt. So you might be, for example, usually operating as a bar where you might do some food or whatever throughout the day. And then of an evening, you've got people usually packed in sort of shoulder to shoulder drinking and so on. Um, that sort of thing isn't going to work initially. So you might be wanting to start to think about, well, how can we use the space with perhaps getting furniture in, getting that distance between the tables and so on and so forth. But if that's the sort of thing you want to do, you've got to start thinking about the permissions that you have in place and whether they engage with the way that you want to operate your business going forward. So take an example, you've got a, a busy city centre bar that's usually packed out on a Friday night, that bar is going to have conditions attached to its licence, things like employment of probably fairly significant numbers of door staff, for example. Now, if you're going to move to a model where everyone's going to be seated, um, possibly focusing on dining, for example, then you're not going to want the cost of that potentially. Um, so you're going to need to look at how your licence might need to adapt to what you actually want to do. Um, you might want to consider whether if you're going to focus on food, perhaps do you want to extend your hours? Do you want to open earlier in the morning to, to make the most of, of more trade? Um, so there's various things to think about and, and, and think about now whether any tweaks need to be made to any permissions that you've got um, to allow you to do that. Um, we've talked about businesses using their off sales um, throughout this period, and it might be for some people that you've decided that that isn't viable at the moment, but would it be viable perhaps as something that supplements an on-trade um, business once you're back open? Um, and I think the final thing that I'm seeing a lot of and that a lot of people are thinking about is using outdoor space. Um, I think that's going to be really key going forward. Um, we, Like I say, we haven't yet had the COVID secure guidelines for this industry and for the way, specifically the way that we're going to trade, but there's a lot of noise about outdoor space being, um, being safer. And also I think that's going to be important in terms of consumer comfort and confidence in, in coming to um, to hospitality businesses. So we're talking to a lot of different operators who are thinking about making use of their outdoor space um, or making use of space that they haven't thought about before. Um, we're talking to, we're encouraging operators to perhaps get together. If, you, if you're a group of operators who all face onto a square, can you bring that square into use? Um, if you face onto a street, can you think about pedestrianising that street and working with other people um, to, to try and you know, come up with some new ideas as to how space and capacity might be expanded? Um, and, and then it's thinking about smaller measures as well. Um, you know, things like can you use technology to help you? Can can menus be electronic, um, et cetera? Um, and, and staff training on all of those new measures that are going to come in. Um, was that did that answer the question, Chris? I'm sorry, because I missed as I say, I missed the start of it. <laughs> no, I, th I think I think that's certainly gone a long way to help try and answer the question. Um, but what I would say to everyone listening, if you do have any questions and you're not able to send them through the, the um, question and answer uh, section of the webinar at the moment do feel free to get in touch with with any of us um, or through pro manchester if you've got any specific questions or if you want to connect with any of us to speak further about anything we've discussed today um hey, Chris, on that could, same I just add, could i just add something yeah of course Charles, yeah. i was going to uh, bring you in actually sure on right. this. <laughs> it was just it was just this um for those that might want to do a bit of research mckinsey have released a fairly 
detailed report on how restaurants could respond post-COVID in the US. So it's very US centric, right? So it doesn't, not everything applies to what we're doing, but it's a detailed piece and it's definitely worth a look because they go into all sorts of different measures, many of which wouldn't work over here. Things like drive-in and stuff like that, of course, which is, is, is nowhere near practical for, for us. But it is a great piece of work. Um, equally, Hospitality UK, UK Hospitality have released their framework today, which has gone to government, which they're looking to get an endorsement for. Um, and, you know, that I, I think that's still very much a work in progress. Um, you know, the, the, the Ryanair of the, of the high street pubs, Weatherspoons have come out today as well and said, this is how we're going to do it. And I, I, they, I mean, look, they're not everyone's cup of tea, Weatherspoons, but what they will do is they will they will push the agenda. They will push the conversation because they'll put measures in place and they may well be the testing ground. Um, whereby certain things are kind of adopted or certain things dis are disregarded. Um, I I'd also say this, which is that at the minute where we're standing from, when we look at things like two meters of social distancing, which of course is the is the is the is the distance that that's being, you know, um, promoted by the government. And in fact, just today, I think the. Uh, the, the, the number 10 has released um, a, a variation of how you know what two meters is. It's it's like one sofa, two fridges, uh, a cabinet. I mean, I'm, you, you may think I'm joking, but this is true. I mean, I, only only our uh, only our current government would, would come up with something like this. But anyway, um, when we think in hospitality about two meters um, and maintaining it, it, it makes it become it makes it think it, it, this this is impossible. You just can't do it. So what I would say is I don't think I don't think it's going to be maintained. I think we're going to see a, a, a reduction of that, probably down to one meter. Um, and I would think that anyone who's got a bar or restaurant now who's worried about how the hell am I going to run my business at two meters, I would say don't worry. I would say just think about how you're going to just just wait. A little bit longer, maybe two, three, four weeks longer than than rather than pushing yourself to try and get open on July the fourth um, with a full service offering. Just wait and see what happens because I think the pace at which these measures will be implemented and then revised is going to be really rapid. Mm -hmm. Now, for what it's worth, you know, I'm not setting policy on this, but I just have a sense that that's how it's going to go. Yeah, now that's really interesting, Sean. Actually, and I was going to ask you as well, actually, around events. Um, I mean, you've set it up quite well, actually, in terms of thinking, yes, we will see a reduction from two, potentially we might see a reduction from two to one metre and and similar things. How how will we be able to deliver events like you have at Manchester Central post COVID-19? Um, I mean, I know you've been doing a, a bit of work on this particularly yeah. and, and trying to help shape show, show some of the policy. What are your plug time? There we go. This there we go. Our... There we go. We, <laughs> we love it. We always love a good plug um, on these webinars. So, um, yeah. So could, could you tell us a little more about what your thinkings are? On, yeah. OK, on so I'll, I'll also tell you this. We've actually done it because when we did the build, we had 500 people working 24 hours a day um, and we had to implement a, a set of measures. Um, and things such as this, when we were feeding everybody, all of our hospitality points and catering point were adapted to allow for queuing, distancing and minimal contact. So actually, instead of the usual kind of buffet things that you might expect at a conference, we were doing everything pre-packed, one person at the counter at a time. It was a bit clunky to start with, but by the time people got into the queue and, and, and the distancing and the, and the protocols actually worked OK. We reduced capacity in our auditorium. So that when we were doing the briefings twice a day, um, we I mean, we've got an 800 seat capacity auditorium. Not everybody has that. Absolutely. But we, we, we'd we arranged it so that we could get people safely in and out and sit with there. So so we've actually for we've actually done part of it. And I would say uh, a couple of things in our experience that it, it is possible. Um, it does require a bit of discipline, both in terms of the, the venue, but also in terms of the delegates and the visitors as well. We all know that we can set up all of the right plans and programs, but as soon as you end, as soon as you add the general public into the mix, all hell could break loose. So, um, so you know, it does require discipline on both sides. But um, it's clear that the large scale events that we operate, um, it's unlikely that um, many of the measures are going to be compatible with those events, with, with those measures. Um, and so I think that, that by the time we get back into the, the swing of, op of operating large scale events, we will have seen a, a significant relaxation of some of those measures, possibly 
um, and you know I could be accused of being over optimistic, but possibly accompanied by more progress with the vaccine, more progress with treatment. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I, I actually don't think we're going to have to worry about how we operate some of our events with some of these stringent measures in place, because I actually think that some of those measures are going to be relaxed. Yeah. If it turns out that certain things have to be put in place, that we have to check people's temperatures when they come in, that we have to improve, enhance, uh, increase the frequency of our cleaning regime, if we have to manage crowd density in certain spaces, then I think we can do that. Um, in the same way that the supermarkets did it like that, not, not particularly effective, but they did it. I think in our industry, the events industry, we could do it. Is it is it attractive? Is it desirable? Is it effective? Is it something you want to do? Probably not. Um, and, I, and I think that yeah. the, the, the thing that's going to determine whether we get you know, large scale events up and running again will be will be consumer confidence and consumer confidence is going to come with the passing of time and with proof that actually as small events start, actually it's OK. People get used to it. People understand how it works and one thing leads to another. And before we know it, a, a 50 person event becomes 100, becomes 500, becomes 1000 and we'll be back to normal. How long is it going to take? That's that's the question I don't know the answer to. Yeah, that's really interesting. Tom, can I ask you about that as well? Obviously, from the hotel perspective, I mean, um, most, if not all of our hotels uh, across the city offer similar in terms of um, events, hospitality space, weddings, so on and so forth. Is, is Are you thinking similar to what Sean's just, just talked about there in terms of the the opportunities to start reopening some of those activities and, and opportunities? Yeah, I think you'll see a lot of hotels with those facilities and open those facilities straight away. As Sean said, it's going to take a lot of time and those at the minute, I mean, I've not really considered what Sean said about the, the uh, restrictions being relaxed, but those capacities are going to be reduced to such an extent where you're going to be losing money. So I would see some hotels with those conference and events venues not opening those conference event spaces uh, for the time being until we do either get a vaccine or the public confidence or uh, is back as such. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's great. Thanks, Tom. And um, we are getting a few questions coming through the, the Q&A. So what I was going to do, I was going to take those towards the end um, of the session so we can try and, and, and get through as many of those as we can. So for the next few minutes, I was, I was going to ask all three of you, and I'll start with um, you, Becky, if that's OK, is what changes would you like to see acted at a local and a national level that would help the sector going forward? P think, think that you're at the uh, press conference every day now you're sat directly opposite the ministers in charge what's your ask of them what's, what would you like them to implement to try and help and if you can also try and suggest something for um greater manchester and the mayor's team and so on what, what would you really like to see some something being implemented to help the sector yeah, it's a couple of things really. I think the first thing would be um, the focusing on the national timeout that I mentioned. I think that's huge. Um, but in terms of sort of um, the sort of stuff that I deal with, I think there's a couple of key issues that can be addressed quite easily through policy. Um, I, I mentioned the outdoor space. Um, previously, we found it quite difficult sometimes to um, allow clients to use certain outside spaces. Um, I think that needs to be facilitated now rather than regulated. Um, there is talk about that. There's talk about government making it easier for us to use sort of public spaces for um, hospitality operators, um, you know, pedestrianising um, various streets, as in fact, Deansgate has been. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to see that made easier. Um, and encouraged, um, I think. And the the third thing is um, from a sort of technical and slightly geeky licensing policy perspective, um, we tend to find that licensing policy is a little bit of a pendulum, if you like. It swings between facilitation and regulation. Um, and I think that Sean mentioned at the outset um, the way the sector is sometimes viewed. Um, it isn't it isn't always viewed as the fantastic thing that it is. It's viewed as something that needs to be restricted. Um, and I think we've potentially gone too far down that route now. Um, and I would like to see some relaxation of licensing policy um, in, in a lot of main city, major cities across the country. Um, there are policies which create a presumption against the grant of new licenses in city centre areas. 
I'm really pleased to say that Manchester isn't one of them. Manchester is one of the only city centres that doesn't have one of those policies. It does have one down in Fallowfield, but not in the centre. Um, but on a national level, I would like to see a rethink of those policies, because I think, unfortunately, as much as, you know, we want to do all we can to help and support the operators that are there at the moment, the reality is there are going to be units that are empty. There are going to be operators that, that don't make it. Um, there are going to be licences that disappear. And I think it needs to be easier for operators to get licenses in those units within city centres and sort of further afield and I also think that the operators that do make it need to be encouraged they might you know it might be that when we get to the point that we can go you know jump two feet back into events back into late night operations back into nightclubs that people need to some help to start making up the money that they've lost they might want to extend hours they might want to do things differently to what they were doing previously and I'd like to see licensing policy facilitate that rather than restrict it. That's great thanks Becky. Uh, Tom, do you have any asks or suggestions that you would like to see um, coming at a national or local level? Um, I, 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 what I would like to see is, as you mentioned earlier on, with the, the Carlos scheme is to keep these people that keep these people employed as long as possible, um, so that the industry can be ready to bounce back when everything is back to normal. Uh, as well and um, for us it, it all depends on on how hotels come back and the restrictions that were that are applied to us in terms of occupancies and, and how that can be supported from the government in terms of from the, the national level it's testing antibodies and and uh, the tracing uh, that just has been mentioned at the minute Great, thanks, Tom. Um, and Sean, um, obviously, you've got plenty that you want to be seeing coming forward with the, the policy documents that you're drafting and so on, boy. Is there one single thing you'd like to see in particular? Oh, crikey. No, there isn't. I think there's a package of things I'd like to yeah. see. It starts with a recogni you know, proper recognition for the industry uh, in terms of the role it plays for the economy, for society, for employment and so on. You know, we're seeing the retail sector in disarray. Well, actually, hospitality was it was a great, a great potential um, uh, 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 area where people that were being displaced from retail could actually find good rewarding careers in hospitality um you know th now that stopped overnight of course as, as everything's closed but that in the in the future that's going to happen so i think the value of the role that hospitality plays in the industry i'd like that to get louder cut through in government i think some progress is being made but it's not for me it's not it's not been good enough and I sit on a few of the boards that feed up into DCMS and others and I just I just think that we're not we're talking at the table but we're just not at the right table um, yeah so so that's one thing secondly there has to be this tapering up Becky mentioned it excellent I mean I was struggling for the word but this tapering is absolutely what we need as as business gradually rebuilds then I think we can start to wind down the the measures but if we have this cliff edge which the Chancellor has said we're not going to have then I think the the impact for many businesses will be catastrophic because you won't be able to bridge that gap because the measures that are going to be in place immediately post COVID will not be viable for many companies. So we've got to have these step downs while as an industry we step up. Um, and, uh, you know, that that for me is, is one of the critical areas. And, and lastly, for the, the events business, you know, Manchester Central alone is responsible for bringing something like 150 million pounds worth of economic impact into the city of Manchester. Business events in the whole of GM, it's worth about 870, 860 million pounds worth of business, uh, of, of economic impact for, for Manchester as a whole. So business events are critical to the economy. And what's been really disappointing in all of in all of this stuff is just this this lack of recognition that the the, the of the role that the business events particularly sector plays in the city economy and how it feeds the bars the shops the restaurants the hotels and everything else not just in manchester but in in london when you talk about london those numbers are in the billions by the way the people that are employed are in the hundreds of thousands by the way so for us to get the, 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 the scarce mention that we do is it's, it's almost obscene it's almost offensive to me so we've got we've got work to do I think and I, I my fear is that that it doesn't get captured and we see some fantastic businesses not make it and that would be such a shame yeah absolutely I completely agree with you with that Sean I mean I think we we've 
we're very lucky in Manchester with the number of event well sp event spaces that we have such as yourselves Manchester Central I mean I'm I'm from a politics background so I've attended many a party conference at Manchester Central um, similarly sport and how sport is a great supportive driver for the hospitality industry um, not just in, in terms of um, having test matches at Old Trafford and the football at either the Etihad or Old Trafford as well um, but also those those uh, spaces are also providing event space as well and opportunities with adjacent hotels and so on it's such a, a knock-on effect that whenever and anything takes place in the city whether it is a concert um, or a band playing to a sporting event this everyone benefits from it and I completely agree with you Sean I think it's it is remarkable the little attention sometimes the hospitality sector gets particularly when it comes to government trying to manage this now we're coming quite close to the end of the webinar and I've seen we've actually had a few more questions come in so so what I want to do is um, I'll try and ta I'll try and ask each of you one of these questions for you to answer. And then there's one at the end that I'm going to ask each of you to answer, which I think is a nice fun one to finish with. Um, so to start off with, um, we've got a question here that says, uh, oh, do, 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 questions vanished. So one the, we'll, we'll, there's a question for you, Becky, about legality. Um, about whom, who has the legal liability for the safety of the attendees of a venue? Um, is it the venue itself or the organisers? Um, and is that something we could get greater, greater clarity on? Because um, obviously ensuring that vulnerable groups are protected and trying to reduce the risk of people with symptoms attending. Is there any clarity in terms of where the liability lies for events taking place? Yeah, I mean, well, so uh, under the Licensing Act, there is a there is a public safety licensing objective, um, and I think that's what, um, from a licensing perspective, um, business uh, venues are going to need to focus on. Um, so, if if you as a venue hold a premises license, um, you're going to need to be ensuring that the objectives are upheld as a venue. Um, now, if you've got some, if you've got somebody external coming in. Um, to operate those events. If you hold the licence, ultimately the responsibility is going to fall with you. Um, so it's, it's your responsibility to uphold that public safety objective. Um, we're actually starting to see a little bit of that already. Um, I'm sort of hearing anecdotally over the past couple of days. Um, now that we're we're all allowed out to you know to sit out in the sun as much as we want, for example, um, some of the pubs and bars that are offering alcohol for takeaway. Um, are starting to be become busier, people coming in, grabbing a pint and then going and sitting in the nearby park or whatever. Um, they've got queues. Um, we've started to hear about authorities going in and saying, look, this isn't safe because you've got too many people here, despite the fact that it's entirely legal, um, you know, from an off sales perspective, from an operational perspective, um, they need to also ensure that they're keeping the public safe. So, yeah, that 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 would fall with with a venue with the license holder, um, regardless of who might be operating any particular event. Great, thanks, Becky. Uh, this is one for both you, Tom and Sean. Um, there is some division of opinion in this country, with some feeling the current measures are too extreme and others feeling they are insufficient. Do the panel think there is a risk of venues being publicly shamed, perhaps unfairly, when the inevitable reopen, reopening happens? And will there be a need for will there will there need to be a PR investment made, perhaps from the whole industry, to combat the sensationalist social media posts that will come? Sean, you're you're smiling brightly at did that. I, did I you? write that question? Is that my question? <laughs> I don't. I, I, it says anonymous if you're going by a pseudonym, but go on. You take it first, Sean, and then Tom. You, if you go straight after. You know, I, I think um, I think people will there will be. Um, parties that are motivated to find flaws and failures um, and then exploit them for likes um, and you know that's the world we live in across the board now so it just means that we have to do our job properly do do we have to take this, this this aspect of it seriously yes absolutely we do and I think that links back to the last point about legalities and liabilities and stuff like that um, I, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm less I'm less concerned about potential liability associated with somebody going to a place and then coming back and saying, oh, I think I caught I think I caught COVID there because I, I think that we'll have sufficient measures to make to make that kind of claim or accusation just impossible to prove um, in the same way that someone could say to me, look, can you guarantee 
that I won't get COVID if I come to the venue. I would say, well, can you guarantee that none of your visitors and delegates have got COVID before they come? So I, th I think we, in, in some cases, you know, we 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 take a, pragma a pragmatic and a, and a and a God, I hate this phrase that we, is being bandied around so much. This common sense approach, which clearly none of us have got any of, because we have to be told everything absolutely, you know, verbatim before we're allowed to do anything. Um, but no, I think I think anonymous there who raises that point is 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 very mindful of the sentiment that is out there in 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 the industry and i think that's that's why we have to be very considered and very careful in the the, the measures and, and 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 the pace at which we we come back um and i think that there will be if you were to plot these on a graph you'll see you'll see changing sentiment i think people initially are going to be very sensitive highly tuned in to looking for this that and the other but I think you know, it only takes a couple of Sundays standing in the queue at B and Q to realise that actually, you know, there are more important things in life. So I think that in that initial period of time, all eyes will be on, you know, the first pub that's open or the first large scale festival that takes place or the la the first venue. By the time two or three are done, you know, it'll be it'll be yesterday's news. And you know what, Chris? much to your much to your pleasure we will be talking about brexit again and not COVID. <laughs> oh sean can't can wait make, sean you you no please i had all of 2019 talking about brexit i thought i'd escaped it <laughs> no we will call it always comes back to me um tom very very briefly because we've got a few minutes and i've got one more question on to ask everyone uh so what um are your thoughts then on the the risks of venues opening and so on and i'll remind you lean to your right to speak into the, the microphone <laughs> thank you uh, i think sean's, there, there, sean's right there's, there's going to be so there's going to be some people out there to try and pick holes and uh, the, the more the more events that happen I think that will become a kind of a national, everybody will want to get back to normal. So everybody will eventually get behind it. And it, those, those few first events where people pick holes, they'll be very much forgotten. Uh, in terms of investment, I mean, as long as you invest, you should be invested initially in making everything safe as a venue. And as long as you do that, then you'll be covered no matter what PR, bad PR or bad press comes out of it. So I, undoubtedly, I think there will be some. Uh, but it'd be very manageable. Yeah. So um, we've, we, we're very close to running out of time now. So very quickly, last question we've had is um, they think a newfound love of hospitality has come from all of this. And they, for one, cannot wait for an ice cold pint. So where would your first drink be post COVID-19? So, Tom, where would your first cold pint be? I'm going to go with Arcane if anybody knows it. Arcane. Right, yeah. Take that. Becky, <laughs> where, where's your first drink going to be? Oh gosh, it's hard to pick one. I think I, I'm going to um, I'm going to promote my local area. So I live in Charlton, and I'm going to go for a crawl down Beach Road everywhere I can possibly go. <laughs> and Sean, what do you think? Where were you going to go for a drink? Uh, well, I'm going to pop downstairs to Manchester Gin, and I'm going to have. Uh, I'm going to have one of their uh, one of their special cocktails, I think, and then um, and then yeah, this is the great thing about our city, right? There's so much choice, and we've we've actually seen a real explosion of of whether it's independent bars and restaurants that are opening up. You know, we know Manchester's been this great kind of hotbed of of new concepts being introduced, and in fact, proven concepts elsewhere coming to Manchester because they want to they want to be a part of it, and that's what's in some ways, the real shame in all of this is that if some of if some of those bars and restaurants don't, you know, don't cut through and we know that it's in, in some cases, it's hard enough anyway for a lot of bars and restaurants um, to, to make it. And so if we if we unnecessarily lose some of these great places because of that, then, um, you know, that would be a real shame. But I, I, I think that I, I, you know, I see a lot of polls. Sorry if we've got time, Chris. I see a lot yeah, of polls on. where they they ask people that you know never go to bars and restaurants will you keep going to bars and restaurants no i won't because it's safe. you know ask people that go to pubs ask people that go to restaurants ask people that go to the cinema whether they'll go to the cinema again and yes of course there's a group there's 20 percent maybe that will say you know what i'm a bit worried at the moment for whatever reasons that may be applicable to them but um 
I think there's a real pent up demand. Plus also we've all got, and this is another thing which is interesting. Um, we've actually got a bit of money in our pocket because we're not spending it, right? So uh, someone's actually put a number on this and it's enormous by the way, and I won't even try and remember what it is, but, but the money that's been saved during all of this, because of this incredible package of measures that have been, that have been, you know, we're, we're not spending as much yet in many cases, not all. Uh, clearly, there's there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and that there's, there's there are jobs that have been lost as well, unfortunately. But a lot of people have been saving money, and people are wanting to get out there and and spend it again. So well, uh, absolutely, just those queues at B and Q, I can testify, it is <laughs> the first weekend that B and Q's opened up or insane with people queuing. Um, but with that, I'm afraid I think we we really could talk for hours on this subject and many others around it as well. So thank you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Really sorry, Liz wasn't able to join us today, but I know that we'll try and probably do another similar webinar in the near future to discuss hospitality, possibly in a couple few weeks' time, maybe when we're closer to that suggested July date of things reopening up and um, see what the latest advice is. I know we've had a couple of people comment on the Q&A asking for, can we get some more advice on this when it's ready? Could we have another <laughs> webinar on this? So I'm sure Pro Manchester will be more than happy to help facilitate it. And certainly here, us at Grayling um, are really keen to help um, with that too. So um, with that, once again, thank you all of you for joining us today. Thank you everyone for watching, um, whether you're watching live or watching on YouTube. Um, look out for the next webinar that we'll be hosting with Pro Manchester coming up. And obviously, all of Pro Manchester's events that they're hosting at the moment and certainly Sean I, I completely agree with you about your comments about it's lovely being able to do webinars online um, but as you can see by my fake background I'm would be delighted to get out of my back bedroom and actually get to see people face to face again soon. So with that, let's, thank and you let's so just have a whip round so we can buy Tom a new microphone. <laughs> yes, yes, it's it's a Lowry Hotel's laptop. <laughs> I can tell you on furlough at the moment. Anyway, uh, moving on briefly. Thank you again, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed today and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.